Everybody, we'll, we'll get started. I'm not going to bang a gavel because we're really self-consciously trying to not have a hearing at these roundtables to allow for good uh, to allow for good dialogue and back and forth. But uh, I'm, I'm I'm Jim Himes. I'm chairman of the uh, Select Committee uh, uh, on Economic Disparity and Fairness and Growth, and I'm just uh, thrilled to be joined by our guests, not witnesses, our guests today. Um, we do these roundtables so that we can have a good back and forth, exchange ideas, um, really interact in ways that get to the truth faster than really rigid rigid five-minute um, interviews uh, can do in a formal hearing environment. But I want to say a big thank you to, um, to, to all of our guests. Um, my colleague, uh, Angie Craig, uh, will, do the, will do the formal introductions of our guests. But um, th this is something that we've, um, that we've wanted to do as part of this, um, uh, of this uh, committee's work for a long time, um, particularly if you, uh, like so many members, I have a largely suburban and urban district, so it's all too easy for rural issues to drift uh, off of the radar screen. Uh, and of course, you know, media is located in our cities and suburban areas, and so it's just a sec segment of our society and of our economy that gets under, I think, reported and underappreciated. Um, certainly for me, anyway, when you start talking about topics like trade, you come to understand how massively important our rural areas and our agricultural areas are to the economy. Um, and obviously, you know, just shy of 15% of Americans live in, in rural areas. Uh, without necessarily the benefit of the exposure and the spotlight that you might get in more urban areas. And we've got just a fabulous group of um, experts here um, to talk about how we can do better around the subject matter of this, uh, of this select committee, which is economic disparity. Uh, and again, I don't know necessarily whereof I speak because of the nature of my district, but um, obviously um, isolation uh, and a lack of connection and a variety of other factors lead to um, too many of our rural areas being on one side of that extreme of disparity. Uh, I'm going to stop talking because I really don't know rural areas all that well, but fortunately, um, uh, uh, Angie Craig, my colleague, uh, I, I forget the exact stat, but when I met Angie many years ago, she said, I represent more acres of corn than people or something like that. <laughs> and, uh, and so she is going to have the, quote, gavel uh, this morning. Uh, I also do want to acknowledge uh, my, my ranking member and, and friend, um, uh, Brian Style. Brian, before we turn it over to Angie, anything you want to add to that? Or? Maybe allow Angie. And OK, and excellent. Well, again, Angie's in charge, and uh, I'm really very grateful to all of our uh, witnesses, uh, or I should say guests, uh, uh, many of whom are friends. Um, and with that, let me recognize um, Angie Craig. Well, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I really appreciate the opportunity to chair the roundtable this morning, and I'm looking forward to this format. And since I uh, share a border in southeast uh, Minnesota with Wisconsin, it's great to be here with the ranking member, Mr. Steele. Um, so I, I want to... Um, I want to start uh, just by introducing uh, a, uh, our guests, and then I'll make an opening uh, statement with some remarks. I'll turn it over to the ranking member, and then, and then we'll ask each of you uh, to, I think this will be the only time we put anybody on a clock this morning, uh, which is uh, your opening statements. We're really looking forward to hearing those this morning. So um, first, we have the Honorable Social Torres Small. Uh, she is Under Secretary for Rural Development for the U.S. Department of Agriculture and a uh, former colleague of ours. Next, we have Dr. Carrie Henning-Smith, who is Associate Professor of the Division of Health Policy and Management and Deputy Director of the Rural Health Research Center at the University of Minnesota and is a point of privilege, also a member of my Rural Health Care Advisory Council. Dr. Henning-Smith, thank you so much for being here today. Um, next, we have Ms. Jessica Fulton, who's Vice President of Policy at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. Thank you so much for being here. We have Mr. Matt Dunn, who is Founder and Executive Director for the Center on Rural Innovation. Um, and there's lots of innovation in rural communities, so we're looking forward to having that discussion about how we can create more. Lastly, we have Mr. Uh, Andrew Siebel, former Virginia State Secretary for the National Future Farmers of America Organization and a Virginia Tech student in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. And as uh, the mother of uh, four sons, I want to especially welcome you here this morning. Um, so I want to start with just a few opening comments, and then we'll go to uh, the panelists for uh, their comments. Uh, Chairman Himes uh, said it right. Uh, I represent community in southeastern Minnesota that is about 65% covered in corn and soybeans right now as we sit here today. 
Given the makeup of my district and my service on the Agriculture Committee as well as the Energy and Commerce Committee in Congress, I've been tasked with representing the concerns of family farmers on this select committee and rural communities. But it's not just the makeup of, that, of my district that makes this so important to me. The mission is deeply personal as well. See, growing up in rural Arkansas, I often say that uh, I represent southeastern Minnesota, uh, and we all talk like that this in southeastern Minnesota, but uh, that's, that's not exactly true. Um, but my uh, grandfather was a farm foreman in Arkansas, and the 1980s farm crisis took out his farmer and really changed the entire trajectory uh, of our family. He had four sons and a daughter. Uh, they all helped with the farming. Um, they lived uh, in a house on the farm. They had to move. Uh, their life changed dramatically. It's because of that family experience uh, and the empty grain bins that uh, are rusting and decaying that when I go home to see my 96-year-old grandmother, who still lives right off the farm, uh, where my grandfather farmed, it reminds me of how much work we have left to do to help our rural communities thrive, to help them grow. Of course, there are a lot of factors that have contributed to the challenges of facing rural America. It's been a very long time, in fact, decades, since this committee, uh, this Congress, looked at what is happening in rural communities and how we can continue to help them grow. It's clear to me that we can and must do more to promote economic growth in rural communities. Because if we don't, the small towns and communities that make this country such a special place to call home could be left behind. Fortunately, there's some good news. Over the past several years, I've seen some encouraging signs of progress, both on this committee and in my personal work with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Just last year, members of both parties came together to pass uh, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, uh, which uh, a number of us, including myself, were very active in ensuring that rural communities did not get left out of the thinking in that bill. Earlier this spring, I introduced the Rural Prosperity Act, which would create for the first time a permanent office in the White House tasked with coordinating federal efforts, all the various agencies that focus on rural communities and oftentimes seem to not talk to one another. Uh, so that is, I think, would be an advancement. And of course, our family farmers. Throughout my time in uh, office, uh, I have done everything I can to support farming in our communities, young farmers uh, coming up. But we also know that an ecosystem of rural communities goes beyond just agriculture. It comes down to whether or not folks have access uh, to health care nearby. It comes down to transit and transportation. Uh, it comes down to many factors that we're looking forward to talking about this morning. So I really want to say thank you to all of you. Uh, for being here, and with that, I'll turn it over to the ranking member for any comments he would like to make. Thank you very much. Um, I am not uh, intimidated by having two Minnesota Gophers uh, at the table <laughs> uh, because uh, Ms. Uh, Henning-Smith uh, grew up in Kenosha uh, County, uh, and Undersecretary Torres Small has visited uh, this great state of Wisconsin and attended a, a visit to a dairy farm with me uh, in Sherman Himes on his drive to Kenosha. We chatted on the phone and said, I am surrounded by a lot of corn, Brian. <laughs> so I know you know my state well, uh, so I'm not intimidated. No, in a, in a serious sense, uh, what is going on in our rural communities right now is, is really challenging. I appreciate you calling this hearing, Mr. Chairman. Um, there's a lot of issues uh, that are playing out, and they're culminating in many ways. Um, I, don't, I, 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 I do have to touch on one of them, which I think is really pertinent right now, uh, and it's some of the rising costs that are impacting uh, our farmers, uh, and uniquely so. In particular, I'd, I'd just identify a few. One is fertilizer. Um, we see fertilizer prices really spiking. Uh, that's uniquely impacted, obviously, by the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict not lost on us, but it does require us to come together uh, to address that now, knowing, uh, at least in Wisconsin, uh, as these farmers are acquiring their fertilizer come fall uh, or come spring, if they fertilize a little bit later, they're seeing their prices up uh, dramatically, up 300%. Uh, I talked to a farmer the other day in Racine County uh, where normally he'd be spending about $360 an acre, uh, or $360 a ton. Uh, he's now spending $1,000 a ton. And so I think it's really pertinent um, that and we have representation uh, from the administration here 
uh, that the administration looks closely at that because our farmers uh, right now today are suffering. It's a difficult uh, issue, but I think one that's very worth uh, our time uh, to be thinking about. Uh, another is the, the cost of fuel. Um, that is uniquely impacting uh, farmers uh, who rely on diesel. There's not electrical alternatives to plow a few thousand acres. Um, and at a period of time, uh, when you're filling up your case, uh, New Holland tractor, and I say that because that's made in Racine, Wisconsin. Um, and so as you're filling that up, I mean, we've seen uh, diesel prices move from $2.64 about a year ago to $5.63. Uh, um, and so while it might have cost about $600 to fill up your tank previously, um, you're, you can now get up to in the neighborhoods of a, a, of a thousand bucks. Um, these are real serious issues uh, for our farmers as they're paying things out of pockets. We see a really aggressive Securities and Exchange Commission um, who is moving aggressively uh, on areas that I believe are outside their purview, in particular as it relates uh, to environmental regulations without regard for the impact that that has uh, on our agricultural uh, communities. Uh, as particular, uh, we could look at the waters of the U.S. Uh, regulation, the impact that that has on our farmers. Uh, the EPA, uh, bureaucrats who I don't think are properly taking into account the impact that that has uh, on the economics uh, of farming. Uh, and when the economics of farming doesn't work, it doesn't work for the livelihood of farmers. And when we see farms unable to be passed from one generation to the next, that's why I care about the economics of the farming. I care because I want to make sure that those family farms uh, that have sometimes been in generations, three, four, five generations, can make it to the fourth, fifth, and sixth uh, generation. I'm excited. Uh, we have Mr. Seibel here, uh, a good EI, so it's an I, Seibel, not, not Siebel. Um, and a little sensitive, I, a little sensitive I, about that. Already. Yeah, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a tough Luxembourg issue uh, that I have on a regular basis in this community. Um, no, I say that I say that jokingly, only half jokingly. Um, but um, I I do think uh, as we look at what's playing out, we have some really difficult times for a lot of uh, folks uh, in rural areas, and uniquely so. Uh, and I'll I'll leave us with one more topic that I hope we touch on. Uh, and that is stepped up in basis in the tax regulations uh, that have a huge impact on family farms making it from one generation uh, to the next. And so we have a lot of uh, localized needs uh, in this country. Uh, we are incredibly diverse. I think it's actually one of our real strengths. Um, the Undersecretary and I were talking about how uh, she's had the opportunity to travel the nation. And you get to see that firsthand uh, as you travel around our country. It's one of the benefits, uh, Mr. Chairman, of you taking us outside of the swamp here in Washington uh, across the country that we see how unique uh, our country is, but also some of the challenges we have, and in particular, uh, in our rural areas. And so I look forward to today's dialogue. I'm looking forward to hearing solutions and ideas about how we address these challenges. Uh, and with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, or Acting Chairwoman, I will yield back. Thank you so much. Uh, let us start then, to, but just by reminding you that uh, these are, this is not testimony. These are your opening comments, uh, and let's start with uh, Under Secretary Tora Small with her opening comments. Thanks so much, Acting Chairwoman Craig. I know it's not testimony, but I've got to start with Chairman Himes, Acting <laughs> Chairwoman Craig, and Ranking Member Style. It's such a joy uh, to get to be here with members of Congress and friends, as well as great colleagues uh, who really care about rural and rural as a place uh, where equity should thrive. Um, so thank you so much for the chance to just have this conversation. Recently, I was in Picacho, Arizona uh, to announce a high-speed internet uh, investment. And it was humbling standing there with kids in the hot playground, trying to answer some of their questions about you know, what's fiber versus satellite, and uh, how do you get, what does internet mean, and how do you get there? It was humbling because they really cared about the topic. They, they might not know what it takes to line fiber on the poles, but they do know what it takes or what it feels like to just sit there and watch the buffer screen when they'd rather see their teacher, or um, have to schedule with their, their brothers and sisters when they get to use the internet or make a drive to a parking lot to do so. Um, and they get that they, if they are going to thrive, if they're going to get that great job down the line, they need to have the same speed of internet as a kid from Phoenix. And that's what equity is about. So. Thank you, members of the committee, for meaningful investments you've made to make equity a reality for that kid in Picacho. And thank you to the fellow panelists here for your work and unique expertise in this topic. I hope today's roundtable will help us discover areas where we can work even more close, closely and achieve meaningful, lasting equity for people
people across rural America. Rural development invests in people because human capital is the thread that holds markets together. Without it, everything unravels. This is something we've known for a long time. That's why in the wake of the Depression, Americans came together to invest in rural electrification. Because we believe that no matter where you live, you should be able to turn on the light when it gets dark. So fast forward to now. As we all know, COVID has had real impacts, and one of those has been making inequities worse. People in Indian country who still don't have electricity now also have to take that long drive to use high-speed internet. That's part of why equity matters and why, since the beginning, President Biden has been clear that rural is part of equity. USDA is focused on this, too. The department's equity commission will soon share its recommendations on how all of USDA can improve racial equity. Deputy Secretary Bernard is the co-chair of the commission, and she says there are currently about 40 ideas that could become recommendations in the future, and we're all stay tuned for that. But today, I'm, I'm looking forward to discussing our shared commitment. The bipartisan infrastructure law helps make sure that rural people and underserved people across our country don't get left behind. But I'll be the first to say there's work to do. When I meet with people in colonias or in remote villages in Alaska or other parts of rural America, they like the idea of working with rural development, but they don't always have the time or the expertise to make it happen. Often, usual suspects will crowd out first-time applicants because if you have a grant writer, that application process is a whole lot less lengthy. We've got to make our applications easier. Equity project is a key part of identifying those barriers. But there's a limit to what we can do when it comes to big projects like high-speed internet or funding wastewater or uh, when it means electricity. Those projects are going to get technical, and so those applications will have to be too. But that's where staff and partners come in. Lack of staff, both time and experience, is one of the greatest barriers to accessing rural development programs. Thankfully, the bipartisan infrastructure law helped address some of that. Congress helped rural development change it by providing set-aside funding in ReConnect for staffing, technology, and technical assistance that helps applicants, all applicants, access ReConnect loans and grants. This allowed rural development to hire industry-specific staff, to improve our portal for applications, and to provide technical assistance for those very tech technological applications. It's a great example of the impact we can make when our programs are easier to access and we have the capacity to implement them. I look forward to working with all of you today to make sure we use rural developments programs to their absolute fullest potential to support more and better markets in rural America by investing in equity and investing in hardworking people across rural America. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Undersecretary Torres Small. Next, uh, we're going to go to Dr. Carrie Henning Smith for her opening remarks. Thank you. Chairman Himes, Acting Chairwoman Craig, Ranking Member Stile, <coughs> thank you for this opportunity to participate in today's discussion. I'm an associate professor at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health and deputy director of the University of Minnesota Rural Health Research Center. Everyone should have the opportunity for good health and quality of life, no matter where they live. Yet on average, rural residents die sooner and have poorer health than urban residents. The COVID-19 pandemic has only made things worse, with higher COVID death rates in rural areas for most of the pandemic. Inequities in health and mortality are important in their own right. They also inhibit economic growth and prosperity, which can lead to additional health disparities in a vicious cycle of economic and health inequity. It is important to note, though, that rural residents are not monolithic. For example, one in five rural residents today is black, indigenous, or a person of color. And health outcomes for rural BIPOC residents are significantly worse than for rural white residents and for all urban residents. Rural counties with a majority of black or indigenous residents have the highest premature death rates of any counties in the country. Access to healthcare is one contributor to rural health disparities. 
Since 2010, 140 rural hospitals have closed their doors. Rural areas have also seen a decline in other healthcare services. These include nursing homes, pharmacies, and obstetric units. From birth to end of life, it is more difficult to access the care you need in rural areas. There are many causes for the decline in rural healthcare services. Reimbursement rates, uncompensated care, and access to health insurance are all large contributors, as are the general overhead costs in low volume settings. Healthcare workforce availability is another huge contributor and was made worse by the pandemic. Solutions for this might include training and pipeline programs, as well as financial incentives for providers. However, solutions must also focus on the overall vitality and appeal of rural communities, including strong infrastructure, job opportunities, housing, childcare, and education. At the beginning of the pandemic, Congress and the executive branch acted quickly to ensure that healthcare was continued resulting in a dramatic expansion of telehealth services, expanding options for rural healthcare delivery. Additional legislation, such as H.R. 8169, to establish a rural, te rural telehealth access task force, introduced by Representative Craig, is an example of additional federal policy action that would expand and solidify access to telehealth services into the future. High quality telehealth services require access to a reliable, affordable broadband internet, however, as well as the devices with which to use that internet. And those issues remain challenging in many rural areas. Inclusion of funding for broadband connectivity build out in the bipartisan infrastructure law was needed, but equitable implementation is critical. I've laid out several challenges in rural health and health care, but rural areas also have considerable strengths. Rural residents and organizations can be incredibly resourceful and innovative. Many rural areas also have particularly strong social capital. This social fabric provides a tapestry on which strong health and health care can be built given the right support through investment in infrastructure and resources. I also want to acknowledge the work of the Biden-Harris administration and Under Secretary Tora Small on addressing rural health disparities, especially in the area of rural maternal health, including the passage of the Rural Moms Act. And I want to thank members of this committee for your attention to rural issues, including the connection between rural economic prosperity and rural health. Thank you again for the opportunity to participate in this discussion, and I'm looking forward to any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Dr. Henning Smith. Um, now we'll turn to Ms. Jessica Fulton for her comments. Thank you, Representative Craig, um, for your leadership in bringing issues facing rural communities to the forefront of the policy discussion. I really appreciate the opportunity to participate in this roundtable, and thank you, Chair Hines and, F and Ranking Member Steele, for um, your leadership on this committee. I am going to start really quickly with like a thank you for talking about corn so much. It made me feel very much at home. I am not from a farm. I didn't grow up on a farm, but um, I did grow up across from a cornfield, so uh, <laughs> I get it. Um, my name is Jessica Fulton, and I'm the Vice President of Policy at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. We are a research organization focused on providing compelling policy solutions to eradicate persistent and evolving barriers to the full freedom of black people in the United States. My testimony focuses on opportunities to support some of the most excluded members of rural communities, black people living in the black rural South. The Joint Center defines the black rural South as southern counties comprised of a population that is at least 35% black and counties that have also been designated as rural by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Our most recent analysis finds that the region consists of 152 counties across 10 states, but many of the statistics I'll cite today will refer to 2019 data, which consists of 156 counties, just because of population changes. So we've heard a lot today about challenges facing rural communities. 
And as economist Benga Ajilor stated in Redefining Rural America, the dominant narratives around rural America frequently neglect the experiences of Black, Native American, and non-white Latino populations, not to mention immigrants, LGBTQ people, and disabled people. I appreciate that the, the other panelists that are speaking today have included these populations. Um, uh, Acting Chair Craig, my grandparents, like your grandfather, also grew up on farms, right? They were the children of sharecroppers in Mississippi. Um, and I think the South, hundreds of years ago, actually was once the engine of economic growth in this country, right? With the labor of enslaved persons and sharecroppers, providing the labor that made the country an economic superpower. But today, the region looks much different. The Black Rural South includes about 3.6 million people. About 48% of those folks are black and about 40% are white. And both of these groups face really, really challenging economic prospects. But according to Joint Center Research, black people living in the black rural south face even more dire circumstances than white people living in the black rural south and black people overall throughout the country. Black folks in the black rural south face lower labor force participation rates, higher unemployment rates, lower earnings, and higher child poverty rates. For example, 52% of black children in the black rural south live below the poverty line in 2017. This is compared to just 19% of white children in the region and 36% of black children across the country. Workers in the region face challenges with the economy. The region saw negative employment growth over the period of 2001 to 2017 in contrast to job growth in other parts of the country. And the job loss was significant. The black rural South lost 40% of the manufacturing jobs during the period, about 100,000 jobs. Right? And black adults in the region also have lower education levels than others. As the economy changes and without targeted action, the region is likely to continue to face challenges. Much of the loss in manufacturing roles could be attributed to job loss due to automation. And according to the Joint Center's 2020 report, about half of all workers in the Black Rural South were concentrated in occupations with a high likelihood of displacement due to automation by 2022. So that's things like manufacturing, retail trade, agriculture, accommodation and food services, transportation and warehousing, and mining. The pandemic-related recession likely sped up this displacement. Economists posit that, um, that COVID-19 made it easier for employers to replace workers with machinery. And prior to the pandemic, researchers from the McKinsey Institute suggested that automated relation, automation relation, related job losses were not likely to manifest as sudden mass employment. Some of the occupations were likely to shrink through attrition and gradually reduce hiring. And a lot of the declines would represent a continuation of past and current trends. So right now, these job losses could be going under our radar could be particularly devastating for communities in the region. The Black Rural South also lacks access to critical infrastructure in the form of broadband, which we've heard a bit about today. 38% of Black people in the Black Rural South report that they lack home internet access. Just 23% of white Americans in the region report the same, and only 18% of all Americans nationwide report that they lack home internet access. And we know that broadband access is critical for education, healthcare, and job growth. I believe that federal policymakers have an opportunity to change the trajectory of, of economic growth in the Black Rural South, and in doing so will positively impact growth for all Americans. And the four areas that I would be happy to talk about further in the question and answer period are, are one, ensure that the recently passed Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Job Act creates quality jobs for black workers in the Black Rural South in particular. Strengthen the workforce development system to ensure that black workers in the Black Rural South have the training and supports they need to connect to quality jobs including those created by IJA. Strengthen federal worker supports to improve earnings and labor force participation in the Black Rural South by raising the federal minimum wage, expanding the earned income tax credit, and extending and expanding unemployment insurance for those looking for work. And monitoring progress on broadband deployment in the Black Rural South counties to ensure that all communities can access it. Once again, I thank you for the opportunity to speak, uh, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Bolton, for uh, your opening remarks. And now we'll move to Mr. <laughs> Matt Dunn. Great. Thank you, uh, Congressman Himes, uh, Congressman Craig, and Congressman and uh, Style. Get that right. Thank you. Yes. Uh, and for for having uh, for having me here and for having this conversation. Uh, my name is Matt Dunn, and I am the founder and executive director of the Center on Rural Innovation. Uh, which is an action tank founded in 2017 to close the rural opportunity gap. Today, we are working with a network of 35 communities across the country, places like Red Wing, Minnesota, Torrington, Connecticut, Platteville, Wisconsin, and Portsmouth, Ohio, 
to help build inclusive tech ecosystems so they can participate in our nation's growing innovation economy. The economic prospects for those living in rural America have been in decline for 15 years since the Great Recession. And this was driven by three things. Uh, automation, globalization, and the decline of entrepreneurship in the 30 years prior to the Great Recession in rural America that meant that there wasn't the farm team of new companies when that economic shift, uh, shock happened to be able to take over. Uh, as a result, since 2007, rural America ha has now a million fewer jobs than there were before the Great Recession. A rural-urban divide has emerged in large part because high-paying, resilient tech economy jobs that are resilient to automation, like computer programmers, cybersecurity analysts, IT specialists, and others, and the companies based on innovation technology are not distributed equally across the country. Automation and globalization created millions and millions of jobs, and it removed millions and millions of jobs. The challenge is that it almost exclusively created them in urban places and almost exclusively removed them in rural. While rural America today accounts for uh, now, unfortunately, only 13% of the nation's workforce, it is home to only 5% of all US tech workers. These kinds of jobs have been proven to provide the greatest opportunity for economic mobility even for individuals with a, without a traditional educational background and are resilient in the face of automation. Given the continued acceleration of automation in manufacturing, agriculture, and service industries, we believe geographic equity will only be restored if we can bring the number of computer and math jobs in rural America up to 13% to equal the proportion of the workforce. We must also be clear that rural America is not white America. Nearly 50% of all rural black population live in a persistent poverty area compared to 12% of the rural white population and 9% of metro black population. Rural BIPOC communities face even greater barriers to participating in the tech economy. Black workers in rural zip codes are employed in computer and math and management, business, and financial occupations at less than half the expected rate, given the share of the population. The good news is that Congress can make a difference. The unprecedented $43 billion investment in broadband expansion through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act has the potential to ensure that connectivity will not be a barrier for any rural person or community prepare in technology jobs or innovation entrepreneurship. There are, however, additional steps policymakers need to take to ensure this opportunity can become a reality. First, invest in rural tech workforce development. The need and opportunity for federal investment in rural tech skilling programs has never been stronger. The pandemic brought many coding and IT boot camps online providing an incredible spectrum of training providers that can deliver directly to rural learners or, perhaps better, in partnership with existing educational institutions like community colleges. And the demand clearly should be there. In our recent report funded by the Ascendium Foundation, we've estimated that there are more than 80,000 missing tech jobs in rural America. These are jobs that manufacturers, banks, governments, and schools, non-tech industries, at the core of most rural communities are outsourcing to cities or contractors overseas because they don't believe they can find the local talent they need. The second part is support tech entrepreneurship ecosystem development. Tech employment is only part of closing the tech economy gap. To achieve long-term change, we need to build opportunities for rural entrepreneurs to, bring, to build new innovation tools and bring those products to market. It is these kinds of homegrown, venture-backed companies that can build wealth in smaller population centers as long as they do not feel forced to move to major cities to achieve their vision. Make no mistake, we do not believe that rural communities uh, can or should become the next Silicon Valley or Kendall Square, but tech can be part of every micropolitan economy. Rural entrepreneurs are already tapping into the power of cloud computing, AI, and open source software to build innovative solutions for everything from space junk collection 
in the UP uh, to auto repair customer service experiences, brand research, and reducing suicide in institutional settings. Key programs like the Economic Development Administration's Build to Scale Challenge and the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Rural Innovation Stronger Economy grants can provide operational support to these startup programs, but only when properly funded. Necessity has always been the mother of invention, and automation is creating that necess necessity across rural America today. Local leaders across the country are working hard to ensure their community has pathways to new economy jobs for their increasingly diverse, creative, and innovative citizens. However, that necessity must be met with strategic public resources to ensure the great work Congress has done to expand access to connectivity will translate into restoring an economic equilibrium across the nation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Dunn. Uh, next, we'd like to go to Mr. Uh, Andrew Seibel. Did I get that right this time? Excellent, excellent. For your opening remarks. Good morning. Great, it's on. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Seibel. Thank you so much for having me. It is truly a privilege to be here. I ran up from our state leadership camp to come in this morning. I'm going to run back this evening. But it is amazing to be here. I'm here on behalf of the National FFA Organization which currently services over 850,000 dues paid members. And we are the premier leadership organization within agricultural education. Our mission centers around premier leadership, personal growth and career success. And our vision is to create the next generation of leaders who will change the world. We use the Chinkering leadership model and Kolb's experiential learning to create a positive student experience. In 2020-2021, I served as a state FFA officer. During this year, we are trying to be the face of our state associations and service members all across the Commonwealth of Virginia, in my case. The majority of our members are rural, but we serve members from all walks of life. Although the heat of the pandemic did hinder my experience to serve as a state FFA officer in a traditional format and open up an insight into, this, into the disparities that our rural communities face, and it sparked a passion to help these students reach their full potential. In November of 2020, I walked into a courthouse in Carroll County, Virginia, deep in the state's southwestern part. I was invited to Carroll County Middle to give a leadership workshop based on self-worth and finding hidden potential. To provide some context as state officers, we are trained to be, um, sorry, we are given intense trainings in order to provide leadership workshops and conferences for our students and this was one of those opportunities, as well as an opportunity to spark change in the lives of students. Unfortunately, there was, an, there was a COVID outbreak at the school, and we weren't able to visit in person. I was ready to give up on the visit when the agricultural instructor made separate accommodations. Mr. Carpenter was his name, and he called me up, and he had an idea. He told me I could give the workshop downtown in a courthouse, and students could transport themselves with their parents. This group of students is one of the most incredible groups of students I've ever worked with. And don't get me wrong, it was incredibly humbling to have students drive 45 minutes out of their way to come to a leadership workshop I was providing through FFA. But I have to ask, how many students that day did not have the resources to come to that workshop? And there was no broadband access in that community, so there was no virtual option to help them either. How is this fair to our rural students? This is just one of countless stories I encountered during my year as a state FFA officer. Many students across the rural part of our state had an, had an extremely inequitable experience during the pandemic. And Virginia has some of the best rural broadband in the nation, yet our students were still left out to dry. Rural communities also face another significant obstacle, isolation. Whether it be in agriculture or not, isolation contributes to many mental health issues. There are many days on the farm, in the classroom, or driving a truck that you will never feel a genuine human connection. Between razor thin margins, increasing costs, and the general perception of rural life from those outside of rural communities, it creates a life that often feels just like one punch after another. It's a harrowing experience. We need to make sure our rural communities feel empowered, that they feel strong, and they feel like those students felt in the courthouse that day. I come from a 400-acre beef cattle and wine grape farm. I take incredible pride in that fact. 
My grandfather started the farm, and I am the third generation if I end up going back to the farm. Our families had to diversify heavily over the years in order to remain profitable, but even at our scale, both my parents have to work full-time at Virginia Tech with advanced degrees in order to put three children through college without any significant debts. Our agricultural communities and rural communities can have a bright future. They certainly have a future, as they're the industry that feeds our nation, but it's a question of what that future looks like. I do not have the answers. However, I do know that if we bring more vocational training to our rural communities, bring proper communication resources, encourage industry to branch into these rural communities, we could see a massive rebound. This, along with removing the stigma that comes with working in a rural community, um, sorry, could lead to quite the prosperous future for our rural communities. I believe that the solution starts with education, ensuring that all students feel that they have the same opportunity, feel that they can conquer the challenges that they face and seek any opportunities post-secondary post without facing hurdles that they cannot control. Whether it be a child facing difficulties in an inner city or a child in the middle of Appalachia facing difficulties, we need to make sure they have a future they can look forward to, a future that we can create, a future that starts with economic and infrastructural development within our rural communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Seibel. Um, now we're gonna turn it um, to the conversation part. So um, I think the way that uh, this will happen is uh, we'll, I'll ask a, a question and we'll have uh, someone respond to that first. If anyone wants to chip in, uh, who's a panelist today, awesome. I'll turn it over to ranking member style uh, and then we'll go by, unfortunately, seniority. Uh, I'll have to get, uh, I, I know Marcy's got, you know, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just start there. Uh, yeah, okay that's that. right. So <laughs> she's proud of that, by the way. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll go by seniority here as we ask additional questions. So thank you so much. Um, you know, the first thing is um, I represent a district that is, um, it's rural, it's exurban, it's suburban, which is unusual in America today. Uh, there are different parts of it. But the first thing is I think people need to understand rural America uh, in order to actually address the issues. And um, as Ms. Fulton said, um, having grown up in the rural South myself uh, and now living and representing uh, parts of rural Minnesota, uh, there are some, some differences uh, across rural America. So I think I'll, I'll start with uh, Under Secretary Torres Small and ask if anyone else wants to chip in. But, you know, as the administration, as you think about uh, what local factors and diverse rural needs um, are, what should we, we take into account as we localize uh, our support? Because we, we can't treat rural community and rural America as a monolith. We, we all have come to understand that as part of this select committee. So Under Secretary Torres Small. Thanks so much, uh, Congresswoman Craig. Matt and I were talking earlier about some investments that are happening in Ada, Oklahoma. And, and, and what he said was, there's some really exciting local leadership there. And it's, it's so true. When I think about a place that is making you know, turning rural development investments into a change for better job opportunity in the future for the people who live there. It's, it's those local leaders, it's the people who are passionate about their hometowns, they've chosen to be there and they continue to make that choice. And so rural development's really interested in how we invest in those local leaders, how we help build that capacity because you know, Andrew's, Andrew has a future that he wants to, to continue on your beef farm and to continue ranching. And the opportunity to do that um, is, is something that we want to invest in. But it takes that local capacity uh, that, we're, that we're looking to find other ways to support. So I'll just open it up. Any of the uh, additional panelists have anything to add? Um, one, one point. We, we frequently say when you've seen one rural community, you've seen one rural community. And I think that's absolutely true. And so the uh, undersecretary's comment about investing in that capacity building, um, which is sort of a, a bureaucratic term, is super, super important um, because the best thing that we can do is actually empower the local leaders who understand those assets to be able to build out uh, the kind of work that can uh, allow for an economy that imports cash and exports value uh, because that's going to be critical to that future. With that, uh, Ranking Member Style, do you want to ask the next question? 
be happy to. Um, one of the things that I find challenging um, is young people in particular moving out of our rural areas um, in how we address the brain drain. And maybe I'll just keep the, the question short to allow uh, a number of folks to answer about what you think the biggest challenge is and what you think the biggest opportunity is uh, to address that. And in particular, I, I know, uh, Mr. Dunn, uh, your reference of bringing in other areas, bringing in uh, tech, bringing in um, other types of jobs, but also how do we keep folks um, able uh, to maintain the current occupation uh, of agriculture and farming? So happy to start with you, Mr. Seibel, and then open it up uh, to anybody else. Well, I was actually um, pretty touched by what Mr. Dunn said because I'm someone who really loves technology and my two siblings and myself both did really well academically. And I know there were a lot of challenges when I was applying to college and still while I look forward to what I hope to do with my career and that I feel like if I want to go into a technical field, I can't stay in a rural community right now. And that's really hurtful. And I know a lot of people feel that way. I have many friends who are going to Virginia Tech Engineering who came, went through high school with me or going all different ways in their lives. But they feel like they can't come back to Botetut County if they're doing something that's more technical. And that's just an unfortunate reality. And I think it's just also really important to think about, like you said, you see one rural community, you see one rural community. In my county, I'm 15 minutes away from a community college and I can go get training. I can go 45 minutes down the road to Virginia Tech and take classes. But there are some rural communities where they're well over an hour from the nearest community college. And we're expecting those students to be able to put themselves through in addition to covering those travel costs and then get the training and then come back to a community that doesn't have the infrastructure to provide those technical positions. It's just, it's about reinforcing that. We need to make sure we bring those positions back in order to keep the, like you said, the brain drain. We need to make sure that students who wanna go post-secondary, whether it be to a four-year college or whether it be to a technical college, want to stay in rural America. Thank you. Does anybody else briefly wanna add one, an additional point or I'll yield back? Yes, I, I'd love to. I agree with everything that was said here. And I think that it's important to note that as when you've seen one rural community, you've seen one rural community. The same is true for the concept of brain drain. Generally, we've seen that that's true on average across the country. And yet at the University of Minnesota Extension, there's been some really interesting research on the brain gain in rural communities where they have identified specific rural communities that have seen an influx of people in their 30s and 40s, those people in the uh, kind of early to prime part of their professional career who are bringing in a nice tax base and families. There's a common denominator to those communities that are seeing that brain gain and it's that there are job opportunities. There is access to broadband internet. You can be connected with urban areas and there's, um, high quality affordable housing available. Housing is a real issue in rural communities. So just looking at the overall vitality and appeal of rural communities is incredibly important and seeing the diversity and brain gain and brain drain across rural places is really important. Thank you very much. It sounds like we need to bring Dr. Henning Smith back to the great state of Wisconsin and away from Minnesota uh, to address the brain drain in our state. No, I yield back. <laughs> Fight you for Carrie. I just want you to know that. Um, well, thank you so much. And uh, for those of you who are uh, watching our live stream and for members who just joined, um, since this is a conversation, if any member uh, wants to add a comment after one of our uh, uh, panelists uh, says anything, please just raise your hand. We'll recognize you. Uh, we're a little more casual here in a round table rather than a formal hearing this morning. Um, I would like to offer, though, my uh, Chairman of the Select Committee, uh, the opportunity to ask a question, if you would like. Chairman Himes. Just, just, just one question, maybe, and I, I, I probably pointed at Mr. Dunn, but, but one thing that it, it's been fascinating for me to listen and learn today, but one thing that, that I'd love to surface um, is what, what's the vision? What's the end state, right? I'm, I'm largely ignorant on these issues, but smart enough to know that, you know, the rural communities of 100 years ago are not coming back, small family farms, et cetera. So, um, Mr. Dunn, you said it, we're not looking to create a Kendall Square or a Palo Alto, um, but, and, and I'll start with you, but I'd love, so, so what is the vision? I mean, it, it's counterintuitive that, uh, for, for a lot of people, that, that rural areas would be 
anything other than takers of technology. So, so I, I'm, I'm really looking for the brick and mortars vision. Are we talking about you know warehouses full of developers and lots of expensive coffee, or are we talking about call centers? What what's the vision for that 21st century rural area that attracts people and capital? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, what's interesting is that there has become a narrative. Uh, out there that if you uh, live in a rural place, um, you can't be a creator of innovation and uh, new products that can transform markets. Uh, and the irony is that for 100 years, that's where so many of the innovations came from, uh, usually because you were the only person that was out there that had to fix the thing uh, that was on your farm to be able to solve the problem or for your manufacturing facility uh, some of those innovations that started as uh, ag equipment turned into washing machines, which led to Maytag uh, in the middle of Iowa. I mean, th there was so much IP that was being generated. But yet there has become this narrative that if you live in a rural place, you can't do that, uh, that somehow you can't code or you can't do a technical job, even though agriculture and its innovation is incredibly sophisticated right now. Uh, and the work that a farmer is doing is as much about that kind of technology and data and the new innovations that can come to play to make it more efficient and more viable uh, in today's market. So the potential for rural America is to have an incredibly healthy, diverse economy, uh, to have manufacturing that's going to be increasingly profitable, but also increasingly automated and have fewer people, to have agriculture that thrives and that is cutting edge, uh, but not going to take as many folks that are out there running combines um, when those can become automated. Uh, so we need to make sure that there are also other kinds of jobs that are the fruits of automation rather than just impacted by automation. And it doesn't have to have, you know, hundreds of thousands of those jobs. Uh, you know, all, all tech jobs don't have to be in rural and all rural jobs don't have to be tech, but it can be a piece of it. And it can be in the incredibly beautiful vibrant downtowns. Um, you think about Platteville, Wisconsin, which has the University of Wisconsin-Platteville, which was the mining school, became the engineering school. It now has a really strong computer science program, but the students who are usually first-generation Wisconsin students there are told they have to move to Madison or they have to move to Chicago if they want to take that job and that passion and do something with it. And you can imagine how that goes over for folks who are from rural Wisconsin that they have to leave the kind of place that they love. And so creating an opportunity for someone to stay in a beautiful downtown like Platteville, to be able to have co-work spaces, pitch competitions, uh, you know, coding events, those kinds of things are super exciting and can happen. They just happen at a smaller scale. Uh, you, you do need density in order to create that synergy. Uh, we don't believe that uh, Zoomtown is the solution, especially as, even as some people have moved to rural places and brought their jobs with them because Zoomtown is not community. And you don't create that energy and that synergy and that collaboration that we all know is what pr produces great uh, technology innovations and in companies. But you see it happening uh, in these places that are taking that first step, that are pushing back against the national narrative um, that for some reason that can only happen in cities of 500,000 or a million people. And they're actually creating those companies, attracting investment and really making, uh, making it work. Can I just follow up by asking, you know, there are certain fields that um, coming out of the pandemic really are just going remote. Um, mm -hmm. One of my sons, in fact, uh, works in accounting, mm -hmm. and his Atlanta-based company has decided <laughs> they're not bringing the accounting team back into the office. Uh, do we have an opportunity that we haven't had previously? Um, uh, Ranking member Style mentioned the, the aging of our rural communities over the years. Do we have an opportunity we haven't had? And are we prepared and uh, ready to take advantage of that? Does anyone, uh, if I can just follow no, up with, with that question? Yeah, I may, if, if I may, uh, I, I believe we do. Uh, and it's really powerful and it's creating moments. It does mean the urgency of getting the infrastructure to hullers out becomes that much higher because the haves and the have nots becomes profound in that kind of a scenario. Uh, and it actually creates the chance for people who grew up in a rural place, went off to a city because they felt that was the only place they could have that kind of career, to be able to come back and to become part of the fabric. 
But you do need to create then intentional places for folks to come together. Mm -hmm. What rural places do really well is collaboration and create community, which is great for companies and businesses. So the creation of co-work spaces as the new community commons, as the new uh, incubators, uh, even though it's people working for different companies doing different things, the synergy that comes around a, a, the, the coffee table and the mixer kitchen and whatever else can be incredibly powerful uh, and can allow for the whole to be greater uh, than the sum of the parts. What the pandemic has also done is open the aperture of people who are looking for people with talent and, and investment opportunities. And that's, I think, ultimately going to be even more powerful. Uh, we've seen the amount of uh, venture capital uh, going to uh, rural zip codes increased since 2017 um, from $3 billion in 2017 to $43 billion uh, in the last year. And that's a huge shift. It's still only 2.5% of all venture capital, mm -hmm. but it's a big increase. So people are, are starting to think about rural America differently, understanding there's huge opportunity and value, and it's what gives us uh, optimism. Marcy. Representative Kaptur. Yes, um, not really formal. Um, <coughs> first of all, thank you for this excellent uh, session on rural America. And when you said Maytag, you triggered. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I spent a lot of time in Newton, Iowa, trying to save those jobs. And so maybe a little focus on that wouldn't hurt. We have to think about the economics of rural America, including the manufacturing. Uh, that had occurred in those places. Newton, Iowa's poverty has gone up between 10 and 25 percent since the closure of Maytag. It was a magnificent American company. We went through back in the 90s the outsourcing of U.S. manufacturing for cheap wages. And then when you go to the places like Monterey, Mexico, where that production was relocated, you will find the people who work in those companies can't afford to buy what they make. So we have an issue that deals with global equity. And uh, our people in rural America and urban America have been caught up in this struggle since I was first elected to Congress. In fact, it's what drove me into elected life. Um, so um, the diminishment of Newton, when Fred Newton, the head of the company, or Fred uh, uh, Maytag, is buried right there looking at his company. I was so impressed with the community's values, the rural communities, they value one another. And uh, so to see that in Newton was a really um, striking reminder of what's happening across America. Uh, so I think it's really important to think about the economics mm -hmm. of rural America as well as agriculture itself. And as we move toward a new farm bill, um, I think it's really important for us to think about the economics of rural America and agriculture. Because what's happening now, if you look at the hog industry, um, what is the largest facility in our country um, relating to the um, processing of, of hogs? Smithfield, uh, bought by the Chinese. So what we're seeing is that the financial system, Maytag had the outsourcing of Maytag happened because of hedge funds and what happened in the buyouts and the outsourcing. So the financial system has become much more powerful in our country than manufacturing and production. And we have to make that system more equitable um, and serve. So as we move toward a new farm bill, we have to think about how to reinvest and make agricultural profitable. Right, Andrew? You probably see a lot of your colleagues and farmers not being able to make it anymore in the traditional business model. And we have to think about what does that mean and what does it mean for America? I'll tell you, I can't find a good apricot. You find one, you tell me. <laughs> Ra raised in this country, I am sick of those that come in here like baseballs. They were picked green and they're not healthy to eat. And they don't have the nutrient value that apricots used to have that came from California. So, you know, it's, it's sort of, it is funny, but it's sad at the same time. And so I think your comments about the economics of rural America, and in particular agriculture, though we can also talk about manufacturing, um, I think is really important. How do we make that economic system work as we approach a new farm bill? It isn't just subsidy to build a community center. It has to do with repurposing 
uh, rural America. And I think that means investment in controlled environmental agriculture. I think it means, uh, because we're going to need it with climate change, and I think it means biofuels in a way we haven't thought it before, thought about it before. I think it means regenerative soils. Um, and I could go through a long list, but we need to put profits back in rural America, and that isn't happening now. It's being bought out. Mm -hmm. So comments on economics would be welcome. Thank you. To leave, so I wanted to give you a chance to ask your question, and then, uh, Under Secretary, we can come back to you for any additional comments you have. Thank, thank you so much uh, to members, and thank you for the panelists for being here. Coachy, it's great to see you back in the house. Um, South Texas, the region I represent, is composed of many rural communities. As some of you may have visited, we had a, a, a an event there, a, a hearing there recently. Four of the five least connected uh, counties in the country. Uh, are in Texas, and three of them are in my district, in Farr, in Brownsville, and in Harlingen. The average, uh, the broadband subscriptions in the country rate around 82.7%. However, in the, country, in the counties in the RGB, which is Hidalgo, Cameron, Starr, and Willsey, we're at 68, 57, 56, and 60%, something that clearly is concerning, especially in the middle of the pandemic and when we go through hurricanes and complicated uh, times in our area. We have uh, also the 30% of the households have really, really slow internet, the ones that do have it. So it's, it's a complication uh, for our region, which is one of the poorest in the country. And uh, my question is to Ms. Fulton, as we continue to develop the infrastructure for urban regions, how can we ensure rural communities are included in our broadband deployment? And are there successful strategies that we can look at that have been used as best practices to expand and assure our middle um, mile infrastructure to connect many rural communities uh, as in South Texas? Yeah, um, one of the things that we're thinking about at the Joint Center is specifically how to make sure that um, communities of color in particular aren't intentionally or unintentionally excluded from um, the broadband broadband deployment plans that states are, are pulling together. I think um, I think that's gonna require a lot. It's it's the investment in local leaders and, and really um, sitting down to talk with folks to work with them through the process of um, where, where possible um, uh, applying for funds. I think it's making sure that workers are um, equipped with the skills that they're gonna need to kind of to do the build out. And so, you know, a lot of the infrastructure dollars are creating jobs that require just a high school diploma and like a couple months <coughs> of training, right? So like making sure that folks are able to access that training is gonna be really, um, really important that, that the communities have the dollars and that the programs are actually effective um, to getting them that training. And I think, you know, um, what doesn't get measured, like, doesn't get fixed, right? So paying attention to um, different equity reports that are coming out of the administration, um, bringing in folks from from the agencies to say, like, hey, like, what are you seeing? What are you seeing the states actually doing with these dollars? Are you seeing this make it to, to particular communities? And and trying to work with them to make sure that um, they're they're using the tools that they have available to um, get the funds to the communities that that we all care. I wholly agree with Ms. Fulton, and a piece of that, too, is the way Congress invested in the bipartisan infrastructure law. So some money is going to states, and, and in my travels and conversations, different states have different plans, and their way of including people is very different. And when I was in Stark County, some of the conversations I was having, it was very clear, uh, folks weren't completely on the same page about uh, applications and what needed to happen. Uh, and that's where reconnect is a vital piece of the of Congress's investment because uh, we have communities applying, people applying, uh, providers applying, uh, and it's not going through the state. So I want to make sure that we're working together uh, in the bipartisan infrastructure law. There's there's certain underserved communities that don't have to provide a match to access the funds, and that's really crucial. And lo love to work with. You. Yes, absolutely, and and that is a concern in in my district and across the state. The money is. Uh, go through the state, sometimes never get to the counties. We had some that, um, for the CARES Act, for example, where they were asking the, 
uh, rural, poor rural counties to match the expenses, and they just didn't do it. But I hope that we can continue this conversation and work through this as they continue to come up and we get the resources that Congress has appropriated down to the communities that need it most. Thank you so much, and I yield back. Thank you so much, Mr. Gonzalez. Um, I'd like to go back then to Representative Kaptur to ask if you have a question you'd like to pose to the panel. And just I'd like to acknowledge that Ranking Member Style is uh, given us the opportunity just to make sure every member gets to ask a question before we come back to him. Thank you very much. I just wanted to ask them about the economics of rural America and how we turn it inside out. How do we return income back to where hard work is done? And I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying about broadband, but broadband isn't going to be the elixir. It's mm -hmm. not going to fix growth mm -hmm. in these areas. And the, the outsourcing, we, we import almost 100% of the vegetables we eat. In the United States of America, what's wrong with that? Okay. So uh, we allow major hog production to go to the Chinese. What are we afraid of? Are we afraid of hogs? Uh, it, Something's wrong with the equation here. Uh, and so I'm interested in the economics of ro local economics, not just the nation, and because somebody on Wall Street makes money because they outsource hog production someplace else. Uh, I'm interested in how do we turn, return income to those who are feeding our country and handling manufacturing in those places on occasion. Uh, but. We can't live on imports. We have to stand on our own two feet. What I've heard from farmers when it comes to innovation in ag, or when it comes to economics that work in ag, is, is three things. Competition, diversification, and innovation. And so when it comes to competition, the work that we're trying to do to invest in different meat packaging options so that, farm, so that ranchers have uh, different choices uh, and you know, it, similar to, to other scenarios, you've got four of the major package, packagers in beef uh, controlling 80% of the market, there's a challenge there. So investing in those more and better markets is crucial. When it comes to diversification, I, mean, I think that's where uh, you've seen real response to specific economic challenges. I was in Florida and there was a uh, cattle rancher who used to, used to do uh, oranges and cattle. And between the increased cost of the land, because it was near Disney World, <laughs> and the impact of citrus greening, there were real challenges. So he ended up dividing his cattle business. So it was you know, half conventional and then some grass-fed that he sent to those new local fancy restaurants. And then he ended up investing in Brahmin as a, you know, the stud market. And then he ended up doing a kind of pick your own, building into the diversity for blueberries. So it's that diversification that allowed him to survive future rough challenges. But all of that won't be the full solution if we don't pair it with innovation. And that's where things like app harvest in Kentucky, where they do have the controlled environment ag in rural Appalachia, is exciting. And, and that's where our role, both in terms of supporting the um, rural innovation, stronger economies, uh, program, for example, where there's planning assisted there, but also in the infrastructure of that high-speed internet. Uh, if I could say, Ms. Craig, uh, Congresswoman Craig, <clears throat> I hope USDA, as we draft this new farm bill, will figure out how to return income to rural America. So what do I mean by that? Um, when federal programs to procure TFAP or to procure CSFP are done, that some of that happens locally, not just the big integrators that can bring product in from other countries, okay? And I'm not against what they're doing, but that money isn't coming back to people who are raising cabbage in my community does. So I think we need to have set-asides in those procurement programs, including for our food banks, allowing food banks whose major donors are local farmers to be able to contract with farmers in those areas to turn the income back to those communities and help revive local agriculture across this country. Uh, and don't let, and I love supermarkets, I go to them all the time, but don't let them control food policy in the country. Farmers have to have a bigger seat at the table because look at the numbers, right? Look at the numbers of how, what's the average age of farmers now in our country? Who knows that answer? It, it's 62. It, yeah, it's, it's over 58 and a half, which what, that's what it was in 2018, I believe. We have to make it exciting for your generation 
to restore the power of rural America. Okay, and that is what the new farm bill should be about. And Thank you, Representative Kaptur. Uh, let me go back to Ranking Member Style now and see if you have some follow-up questions. Um, maybe let me just go back to the the brain gain. I think it was a, a good phrasing. We think of FFA uh, not only training people to continue in farming immediately after maybe high school, uh, but also kind of boomerang back after maybe going off and doing something for a period of time. Uh, you referenced that, Mr. Dunn. My uh, grandfather before World War II spent a semester at Platteville uh, before he joined the armed forces. Uh, so very familiar uh, with the area. Um, and so maybe maybe open it up to the, the panel. I'd be uniquely interested uh, in you, uh, Ms. Fulton, as we think about that brain gain uh, in the Black Rural South uh, in particular, maybe just kind of a, a speed round if we can, uh, as people's top thoughts on that. Yeah, just really quickly, um, one of the things that we think about a lot is how we make investments in historically black colleges and universities. Many of those are located um, either in or near rural communities, and so there's an opportunity there um, to make sure that local folks that go to those universities, one, come out of college and are able to um, afford to come back home and start working rather than trying to go to a big, um, a big town and, and having to figure out how to pay off loans. Um, but to, so that, you know, those are, those are generally anchor institutions. They can serve as anchor institutions. And if they, if they have the investments that allow them to create the jobs nearby, then I think they can really serve as um, a, a place for folks to, um, to work, to stay, to build community. Mr. Dunn. So just a, a couple quick comments, which actually comes back to Newton, uh, Iowa, which is that if you go to the Maytag plant now, they've actually been redeveloping it into a tech hub, uh, including a brewery, which seems to be critical in tech hubs. <laughs> but uh, but it's, it's a beautiful facility that they're actually repurposing for the future to bring back younger people, because when I talk to younger people, they want to have something going on. Right? They want to make sure that that's a community where there's lots of ideas happening. The other thing that I want to flag is that uh, Land O'Lakes has been a huge advocate for our work. Uh, and it's, it's interesting, you know, when, when we've talked about Ford, about why are, why are you supporting our work? We're not out there necessarily working with uh, dairy farmers. Um, it's because they know that if the micropolitan areas, the hubs in those dairy regions, are not vibrant with different kinds of jobs and opportunities, it's going to have an impact on dairy farmers throughout that entire region. So they've been passionate about it. The cooperatives that they engage have been passionate about the work that we're doing, partially because they know that ag tech is going to be critical to making sure that our farmers are more and more uh, successful in actually increasing profitability and being competitive in a global marketplace because they want to make sure that all of those communities uh, in, in places like Aberdeen, South Dakota, are creating new innovation, new technologies, new companies that can create opportunity. Thank you. And, and the theory of rapid, rapid can I give Mr. Seibel just 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Okay. Um, I just want to maybe provide some context of what it's like on a farm in America right now because I think that's kind of lost. I was talking to Mr. Robert Harper, who's a commodity expert at Virginia Farm Bureau. And in Virginia right now, it would be a multi-million dollar investment on the eastern shore to set up a commodity farm that would create a supplement of income, not an income that could sustain a family. <laughs> that, that in my, for my generation, how would I ever want to go into farming for a multi-million dollar investment to create supplement of income? That's not fair to us. We need to be able to bring that income back to the farms. And I was in California earlier this year in January, and there were farmers who had to figure out how to delay their harvest, so they did not have the vegetable production coming up from Mexico competing with their sales. It's just really unfortunate that our farms have had to grow so much in scale to remain profitable. If you go to the Midwest, you're looking at 10, 15,000 acre farms in order to create any sort of real profit. And People don't like industrial agriculture in the United States, but in order to feed our nation, in order to be profitable, that's what we need right now. And it's, I don't have the solutions. I don't think anyone has the solutions, but we need to realize that we need, we need to be able to feed our nation, but also we need to incentivize people to feed our nation. We need to bring the farmers back that income. We need to make sure that the next generation wants to go into this industry because we need food in our country and we need to make sure that every single person is nourished and able to explore any opportunities that they want to. Thank you. I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I want to 
come back to healthcare, just because it seems to be such an important part of creating that ecosystem where a rural community can survive. Dr. Henning Smith, you talked about 140 hospitals, I believe, that have closed since 2010, or someone here did. Um, help educate us why. I mean, inherently, you think about, you understand that, but why that is, and all the local jobs created, and then what can we do about it? Because it actually is a serious issue, as we've seen consolidation in many of our communities, and a lot of these hospitals that are getting uh, shut down, that uh, also costs those communities really good jobs. So say a little more about that. Yeah, thanks for the question. It's one of those really complicated issues where there's not one specific and singular villain here, which also presents a lot of opportunities. There are a lot of different things that we can do to address this. Uh, for one, it's worth acknowledging that hospitals have closed more commonly in states that haven't expanded Medicaid, and rural populations are already more likely than urban populations to be uninsured, and that disparity is much bigger in states that haven't expanded Medicaid. So access to insurance and reimbursement rates is really, really important for hospitals to make sure that that revenue is coming in the door for the, um, for the treatment that they provide. Also, operating a rural hospital is just expensive, especially in a low volume setting. There are certain things that you need to do in a hospital. You need to keep the lights on, you need to keep it clean, you need to keep it staffed 24 seven, even if you don't have a steady stream of patients coming in the door. And those overhead costs can be really prohibitively expensive. And uh, I think are a reason why we need to think about equity instead of equality when we're thinking about how to keep rural facilities open. Rural facilities might just require that much more investment to stay open and stay viable. Uh, but I wanna come back to workforce because I think it's relevant not only to this question, but to the question about brain gain. What I'm hearing from rural healthcare providers and facilities across the country is that the workforce shortage is at a really critical crisis point. And places that cannot staff their facilities can't keep the doors open. We need to think about ways to train rural residents in healthcare to be able to stay within their communities. We know the single greatest predictor of practicing in rural medicine or rural healthcare is having grown up in a rural area. And so we need people to be able to see those opportunities, to be able to train, for those opportunities within rural communities so that they stay. Um, and I also want to end by just acknowledging, I think that the focus on agriculture is really necessary and appropriate and important, but the most common industries that employ rural residents are education and social services and healthcare. And so if we're thinking about brain gain, if we're thinking about rural economics, we need to be thinking about how to make sure that those jobs and those communities that support those jobs are attractive and viable and that people see opportunities and a pipeline to get into those jobs. Thank you so much. Um, you know, we, we come back to this disparities issue, the equity issue, and um, the, we see that in healthcare in a way that is really just truly really extraordinary and something that we have got to address in the country. Representative Kaptur, uh, do you have a, a last question? And then um, in our remaining five minutes, uh, I'd love to just give each of you one minute to say whatever you didn't get to say today. So, Representative Kaptur, one more question, then we'll get to a lightning round. It would be a really hard question <laughs> because education and healthcare um, are dependent. They uh, do not produce the income that is required to support what they do. Um, and so you have to have a thriving economy locally support them. And uh, I don't want to do to healthcare what we've done in our country to hogs. I wouldn't want that world for anyone. Uh, so um, Mayo Clinic is such a, an astounding place. It's one of the two finest hospital systems, I think, in this country. I'm old enough to say that on air. Uh, <laughs> it took a lot of sacrifice to get them there. And uh, so I guess my concern is, I go back to the original question, how do you make the economics of rural America work? in today's world, mm -hmm. and um, how do we use the upcoming Farm Bill to help push in that direction? How do we do that? And I think the economic issue, broadband will provide certain services and connectivity, right? 
but it won't produce corn. Mm -hmm. It won't displace uh, the vegetables we're importing on all of our portals rather than growing them here at home. We have to make, figure out models to make that productive. I think climate change is going to drive it, but my question remains, how do we restore agricultural production to this country and to the local farmers who are working still so hard? How do we make this a revolutionary farm bill for the country? Okay. And I don't have the answer. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a great takeaway and challenge to the panel and to each of us to be thinking about as we move into the next farm bill. Thank you so much, Representative Kaptur. Uh, I want to start with uh, Mr. Seibel, give you uh, sort of uh, uh, another minute of what you didn't get to say that you wanted to to us today. Um, honestly, I think there's just a lot of value in career and technical education in rural communities. There are, I'm part of FFA, it's one of the career and technical student-led organizations. There are multiple of those. And in those organizations, we have career readiness standards, we have public speaking, we have leadership skills, we have all of these models to help develop our students. And when we're talking about brain gain and things like that, developing the confidence and the competence of rural students is very important. And I think it is very vital that we invest into these organizations and into career and technical education. I come from a rural community, and I was told to my face by a guidance counselor if I wanted to go to college, I could not take CTE courses. That obviously worked out in my favor and worked out in many other students' favor, but I think it's really important to understand to diversify our education as well. Students should be encouraged to learn about rural issues and global issues and not just the traditional education path, and it's something I'm really passionate about. But Thank you again for having me. This has been really, it's helped me gain a lot of insights into rural issues. And I, I'm not an expert in any of these things, but I'm really passionate about revitalizing our rural communities and helping out students whenever possible. Thank you so much. As the mother of machinist, I appreciate your comments. So um, actually, we're going to call an audible here. Um, and we're going to give Mr. Errington a chance to uh, ask any question he might have. And uh, then apparently, I'll check, just give check. each of you another 30 seconds. So. I didn't want to exclude you. Well, I thank my colleague. Um, this is my passion. Uh, th this is the, 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 the every beat of my heart. Uh, when I ran six years ago, um, the, the driving force for me uh, and my, my central pitch to West Texas was to be a champion and, and a clear and compelling voice for why rural America is absolutely, unequivocally, unquestionably critical for the entire United States. The, the first question I think you have to ask is why do we care about rural America? It's flyover country. We have more cows, sows, and plows, as they say, than we even have people. In fact, we have more ca head of cattle in West Texas than 42 states, respect respectively, have people. Why, do, why are we making investment out in the hinterlands? Uh, especially when the investment per capita is significantly different than you would in an urban and suburban area. Um, why not have those country boys and country girls just move to the city? Why are we subsidizing their country lifestyle? Well, I'm here to answer that question as best I can and thank you for being you know, a, uh, an advocate for my fellow rural Americans. The answer is, if you like to eat, if you like the clothes on your back, and if you like the fact that when you turn the switch in your home, the lights come on, then you need to hug a farmer, and you need to thank an energy producer. So, and I'd go even deeper than that. Supporting critical infrastructure and the which supports sustainability of small town America is an issue of national security, period, full stop. And all you have to do is look across the pond at Europe and what's happening. Uh, so good to see you, by the way, my friend, my neighbor. Man, I'm just wanting to hug you from across the table here. But she knows what I'm talking about. You look across the pond at what's happening, folks. America and the world is waking up to supply chains. And there's not a more important supply chain than the food and fuel supply. 
There's nothing more important for a nation. You talk about putting a military out there to defend our freedom, our security, and our interest around the world. If we cannot feed our fellow Americans, if we cannot feed ourselves, then we are weak and vulnerable, and we will not lead as the superpower in the future. We're blessed with natural resources. We're best blessed with great energy and ag producers. And I'm just telling you, if you can give them the sustainability of critical infrastructure, like access to basic care, access to technology through broadband, then we will be able to have food security and energy independence, and our nation will be blessed, and every American will receive that benefit. So it is invaluable, and even though there's not enough patients, patient volume, to cover the cost of a hospital, and the per capita investment just doesn't seem to jive and reconcile with the return on investment we make in urban and suburban areas. The return is that abundant, safe, and affordable supply of food and fuel. And without that, there isn't an exceptional America. And so thank you for the opportunity to speak. I probably went too long and I didn't have any prepared <laughs> remarks, but, but thank you. This, this is one of my favorite days now in six years in serving in Congress to look at a future farmer of America, to look at the smiling faces of my colleagues. And you know what's cool about rural America too? Is it brings us together yes. like veterans. Like we can stop with the you, you know, y'all do this too much and Republicans have no heart and y'all tax and spend too much and let's just have a little, this is, we come together around rural communities. It's pretty special, pretty cool. And I'm, I miss serving with you, so. Uh, Mr. Arrington, thank you so much for your comments. It was an honor to give you those comments and you're exactly right. Uh, and I still have yet to meet a Republican uh, who isn't friends with Undersecretary Torres Small. <laughs> So it's just stunning, Soch. I don't, uh, don't know what the heck your secret is, but that's awesome. <laughs> All right, I'm going to give each of you 30 seconds. Dr. Henning-Smith, uh, anything you didn't say you wanted to? I just want to say thank you for including me in this discussion. I think it's vitally important because no discussion about economic prosperity can happen without talking about health and health care. That's essential to economic growth. It's essential to addressing inequities. And so if we're not thinking about making sure that everyone has the chance at good health and everyone has access to at least very basic health care, then it's a non-starter. So I really appreciate you including me. This was a great discussion today. Thank you. Madam Undersecretary. You can feel the power of place when it comes to rural, the pride of place, and the people who choose to be there. And it takes that collaboration that is so present in rural places to make sure we have their back. And so I just really thank you for this uplifting conversation so that we can work together to do that. Thank you. Ms. Fulton. You know, one of the reasons why I work on the, the topics that I work on is because I really believe that we are only as strong as our weakest link. And I believe pretty deeply that um, black folks in the black rural South have been excluded in this country for a very long time. Um, and we have an opportunity right now with IJA, with the investments that you all have and with the investments that we have the opportunity to make in the future um, to, to really change the trajectory for folks in those communities. So I thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and I've learned so much um, listening to the folks here, so thank you. Thank you so much. And finally, Mr. Dunn. Well, thank you uh, as well for having uh, me and for hearing this wide range of different views, uh, particularly from Andrew, uh, from a, a future rural person. We hope to be able to come back. Um, what I would say is we, we have a number of policy recommendations that we have provided uh, to the roundtable, um, which I think are worth exploring in the context of the new Farm Bill uh, reauthorization, as well as EDA and other things that are going on. Um, and, and, uh, but I also want to say that your uh, job, and uh, Congressman, you, I think you came in at the perfect time, you also have an opportunity to help with that narrative shift, that for too long rural people, particularly rural young people, have said, you can't have technology and innovation jobs, that you don't have the ideas and you can't be in your community to create a new product or technology that can transform the, the world. Uh, and it's just not true. And we just see over and over again, small rural communities across 
the country that are defying that narrative, and there's a real opportunity for, for Congress to be a part of that shift and to talk about the opportunity to unlock uh, rural innovation, talent, uh, and, and um, entrepreneurship, uh, because in the era of uh, broadband, which can be universal, there should be no limit to where innovation jobs and entrepreneurship can take place. Thank, thank you, you so you. much. Reggie Member, thank you for this really productive conversation. I just want to say thank you personally. Um, I am uh, always uh, so pleased to have discussions about rural communities and ag. Uh, it's where we can find a whole lot of common ground, and I'm optimistic that this committee uh, is going to uh, provide a really productive report as it relates to how we support our rural communities. So um, I give you the last word. Thank you for holding today's hearing. I'll yield it back. That was good. All right. Thanks, everybody. I got to run to another committee. <laughs>